Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome on stage the Chief Creative Officer of Greece, Steve Lanakis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, man. Please, join me. All right. Um, Chief Creative <laughs> Officer of Greece. Wow, that's quite a title. I've, I've been called a lot of things in, in the past, but yeah. Never chief creative officer. So we were not sure how to call you because that was just announced. We were talking, I was talking with Steve last week and like, but now, now it is, you're everywhere. So how does it feel to be the chief creative I'm very, officer? I'm very, very nervous and, um, <laughs> and I'm going to get really emotional. So, um, but I, I'm very nervous, but I wanted to start by saying I'm very, very humbled and honored. Um, I left the job. That's not obviously all my work. That's the work that we do globally, but I'm going to show you some of my work in a bit. Um, but I left a, an incredible company, an incredible organization that believes in so much about the positive impact that creativity and technology could have on society, on environment, on economy. Uh, and I left that because I thought that this opportunity was even bigger. Um, and I'm going to give it everything I can. And when you ask me, you know, what is a chief creative officer? I guess the only way I can explain it is by explaining what I, what I did at Google. And what I did at Google is I got really, really talented and really interesting people together and I built a team. Um, and I got people from all walks of life, all sort of uh, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, LGBTQ, everything. I tried to get uh, a, a proper representation of the world as we see it today in my team. And, and we weren't perfect, but we got close. Uh, and then I, I learned very late in my career, unfortunately, what the real role of the individual who brings these people together is. And that role was to ensure they succeed, to create the environment and the conditions for those people to succeed. And that's what I hope to do, working with individuals like yourself and all the great talent this country has, uh, because it's not going to happen if um, we don't do it together. So you clearly also moved to Greece. I'm in Greece. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, in, uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Greece. I'm, I'm living in Athens. My family's here. As I said, everything happened right at the last minute. I was actually uh, leaving to go to the West Coast. Um, to set something up at Google. Okay. Uh, and then this thing happened on in July 7th and all this sort of stuff. And, and, um, and when I saw what happened and I saw the, the momentum and the positivity and, and all this sort of stuff happening and the opportunity uh, came up, uh, I thought this is something that you, you, you know, I, I have to do um, and be part of. So, and, yeah. and also it's... Uh because, you know, there's a lot of talks. Of course, Greece has been in an economical crisis. We all know this, obviously. And there's always this talk about brain drain, brain drain, brain drain, which clearly happened. This is reverse brain drain right here, Yeah, I mean, in a way. One of the things I'm really keen on doing is I spent a lot of time, I spent 20 years in the UK. I, I, grew, up, I grew up in Vancouver. I was born in Vancouver. Um, I was speaking to a lot of people from Crete here this morning. Uh, I, my, my father left Svakia, poor. Uh, in the 60s, we em emigrated to Canada where I grew up. Um, I had never dated a Greek woman in my life. I ended up marrying, marrying a Greek woman uh, from Sofia. <laughs> um, and, and I have three kids, Bravo. all born in Athens. So I have a really strong connection, but I spent a lot of time outside um, trying to be very active. I, I was involved in some of the initial repositioning work in 2013, some of the product development strategy, some of the refugee efforts. Um, but I thought, you know, good, good Greek word, empathy. If you're going to do something, um, and, and I'm encouraging people like me, both inside and outside of Greece, if you're going to do something, you've got to be here. And you've got to understand, like you said, this crisis. This crisis um, has gone on longer than the Great Depression in the United States. Okay? Yeah. Um, and you have to be here, and you have to understand and show a sense of empathy the hardships that most people uh, endured and continue to do so. Uh, and if we can do something about it with our programs, with the way we create new initiatives and infrastructure that creates jobs for young people or uh, 
old people like me as well, um, <laughs> um, we, we, we must do these things. Yeah, and, and do you also hope maybe to set an example, that will be the last question, that will learn a little bit about your past so to explain also what you are here, but do you, do you also maybe expect a little bit of other people following your lead and saying, you know, well, why would I not come back to Greece or come to Greece yeah. because like you, I was born abroad? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's the thing. I think, um, I think it's incredible, like we, we spend so much uh, uh, time and money educating, and, and I, I don't want to make it a negative thing, but educating our young people only to have them leave. And I'm going to show something in a village that we did in Crete, a film, one of the last films that I show, only to have them leave and go build businesses and help other organizations succeed outside of this country. And they have so much to offer. And we, you know, I'm not going to say this because I'm Greek, I think we have the best country in the world, where it's positioned, the food, the weather. I mean, all the conditions are here. And people are trying desperately to find excuses to come back. And that's what, you know, if, if anything, the announcement yesterday, you know, does to a certain extent is acts as a catalyst to say, I believe in it, I'm coming back, and I'm going to give it a go. I, I don't know what will happen a year from now. I don't know if you guys will be like, Marcus, you idiot. Um, or, or, or we'll have done something together, but I want to encourage other people to come back, people who were born here, people who were born abroad. My, my social media channels have been completely flooded. Um, and I wasn't looking to make friends and, and, and get likes and all that sort of stuff. I am looking to make friends, but th that wasn't the reason. People saying, I run this company, I have a startup accelerator, I've built a, a product, like literally, how can I help, how can I help, how can I help? So I might need some help from you going through it all, yeah. With pleasure. So maybe let's go a little bit to what you've done and projects you've been involved with because that will also surface who you are and what you could be doing as in your new role. Can you, can you flip back to the presentation guys please? So we can show the, the presentation here because there's a little bit of videos to show the next content. So here you go. So first one, coming alive. And that's basically yeah. a little bit what I said and other speakers have said is to actually make stuff that is existing coming alive. And obviously Google is very well known for the use of technology and this is a great example, maybe you're going to walk us through, unless you want yeah. to see the video first, of what, it, you know, what I, did you do? I just wanted to show a few examples that relate to exactly what um, you do here. Um, and the first example I wanted to share was something that we did a couple of years ago. And I remember at the time, um, around that time, the Natural History Museum in Brazil caught on fire and it burnt down. And it was so sad. And I remember listening to the BBC World Service and hearing people crying, people who used to visit it, people who work there, just the, the, the general mood, because these are the, the, these houses of humanity. They are the record of every live, living thing um, that, that makes us who we are. So to lose these things was tragic. Um, and, and I'm also a massive proponent of technology, but I, te technology with a human uh, side to it. And I think what was interesting about this project was how do we bring to life these incredible things, these artifacts, as I said, that define who we are? Um, and how do we get young people to engage with them? And more importantly, how do we even get people who have issues with uh, access and proximity? They can't physically get there to see these things and open it up to the world. So we talk a lot about you know, um, technologies, AR, VR, all these sorts of things. And I'm not really interested in labels. I'm interested in, in what you can do with these things. So this opportunity arose to work with the museums. If we go to the next slide. Um, and it was the Natural History Museum in Berlin and the Natural History Museum in London. And they have their iconic skeletons, their, their fossils. Um, and the Romaliosaurus was the largest ever living marine reptile uh, in the uh, London uh, Natural History Museum. And the second one was the Giraffe Titan. Um, and they wanted us to bring them to life. Uh, so we worked with people who had done the special effects, I think for Gladiator, or I can't remember, the, these big films. Uh, if you go to the next slide, to, to do that. Uh, but as I said, if you go to the next one, um, we have a thing called Google Cardboard. And Google Cardboard is a piece of cardboard, literally, that you put together with a bit of Velcro. It's got two concave lenses in it. And then you slide your phone in, and you have a high-def uh, VR headset. 
Um, so VR headsets a few years ago were a thousand a headset. They're down to a hundred, and they're probably even cheaper. I think somebody's demoing some VR in the, in the oh, next cool. room. Okay. It's like, uh, <laughs> should go do a bit of a plug. Um, but this one here was a couple of dollars, which again is still way beyond reach for most people in developing nations, but it's, it gets them closer. So um, we thought, wouldn't it be incredible to bring some of these things back to life. And if you can imagine, the video you're about to see, if you can imagine being in the museum, putting this thing on and then seeing it come to life, or being somewhere very far away where you would never be able to visit this thing for real. That was great. I think maybe one more. Is it coming? Do I need to? There you go. Recently added natural history to their online collection. We wanted a way to encourage people to discover this lost world. Working with natural history museums in Berlin and London, we set out to reimagine what natural history could be for the next generation. Introducing Back to Life in Virtual Reality. Two experiences where people can come face to face with extinct creatures in VR. First, we used laser scanning to capture every detail of the historical spaces. This meant we could drop the dinosaurs into an environment they could interact with. Then came the challenge of the animals themselves. We brought them back to life with an expert team, from paleontologists to 3D animators. Everything from the size of their eyes to the texture and color of their skin was researched and recreated, ensuring scientific accuracy for how they looked, moved, and behaved. So, cool. Yeah, so, thank you. So I don't, I, I don't think technology will replace um, these incredible things that we have in the real world. I think it'll enhance, and as, as you said, Enrich. help give them a, a new life. And if you think about it again from your, uh, and I didn't try to weave it, but it's, the, it's obvious, the um, parallels, like if you went to a site like uh, Knossos in, in Crete, and you were able to do something like this, and we were able to bring back some of this talent, and we had uh, animation production companies like to the, to, to the extent of a Pixar with young Greeks at the helm creating content like this that was distributed around the world and on site in Greece. Do you, do you see, that, that's what I'm thinking about, you know, pulling it together and connecting it. You're talking about connecting, and you're talking about the youth, this is connecting with the history, but it's also connecting with um, culture, Let's go back to our, our presentations. This is maybe, you want to explain what you did there, which is the... Yeah, yeah, this is another one. Very I, cool I, way to connect and, with... Uh, and, the, and the team said, show some stuff that hopefully you haven't seen. So this is another uh, arts and culture. We have an arts and culture group at Google called Google Arts and Culture. Um, and this is something, um, we're doing a lot of work with artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, and one of the things that we've done, if you go to the next slide, is... Um, We've digitized, I think it's just under 100,000 pieces of art. Giga, gigapixel, you can zoom in on it, you can see detail, unlike anything. Again, things we should be doing here with our great, uh, with our great artists. Um, and, uh, but one of the things um, we were thinking about, because we have this whole approach as to how we solve problems, was you can't really find art the way you find content uh, on the internet. So you can't, you wouldn't search necessarily, if you didn't know that was the Mona Lisa by da Vinci, sorry, I don't want to get this wrong, it'll be embarrassing, uh, <laughs> you wouldn't necessarily uh, type Renaissance smiling woman uh, in the conventional way, do you know what I mean? You wouldn't describe the thing. So we thought, in instead of trying to describe the things that we wanted you to connect with and, and, and discover, more importantly, wouldn't it be interesting if you could draw? 
and we had fine artists who were drawing and people drawing today and that shared experience of the doodle of the drawing uh, matched the visual that you had generated with the piece of fine art that had been digitized um, and that's what we did so um, if you go if you click again there you go you see how and I won't go into the detail of it but you see what we've done here we've got the hundred thousand and then we've got the doodles in blue um, and what they're looking for the machines are looking for patterns edges um, all these sorts of things um, that they can relate back to the images and then they begin to cluster them and then we allow for people to go in and, and choose the ones that most closely represent their doodle so you can see it's an incredibly interactive experience. And if you go one more, I need to know. Um, here's a little demo. Um, and you'll see how we designed the user interface to mimic what's happening. That's a house, I guess. There you go. So the machine is trying to figure out what it's looking at. And then it's displaying a bunch of stuff. And you can see the, the, the similarities between the traits. And the machine learning aspect comes in where it says rate the match. And if you think that's the right one, thumbs up. If you don't think, if you think that one's better, click on that one and, and, and vote that one up. And that's how we teach the machines. Uh, and there's a little video again. Yeah, let's go. Uh, oh, sorry, the last thing oh. I wanted to say is, um, so we developed, the in, we developed the interface, we developed the films, we developed the algorithm. Um, but the other thing we thought really, really importantly was, how do you get these things into schools? How do you get them in museums all over the world? So we took a screen, we took it apart, and uh, I remember sitting with the team saying, you know, and sometimes they think I'm a bit crazy, but I said, if there was a, an art class on the moon, what would like the Martians be like drawing on? And we designed this easel that looked like an easel from outer space, and it was a screen that you can draw directly on a little antenna at the top because it's broadcasting to the machines. Um, and it allows you to experience it anywhere in the world in a physical space, which again, physicality is important. Uh, so yeah. Let's, let's play it. Since 2011, Google Arts and Culture has digitized art collections from museums all around the world to make art more accessible to everyone. But with millions of pieces in the collection, how can we help people discover art in a relevant, personal way? Well, what if everyone could use a bit of their own creativity to discover great works of art in a whole new way? Introducing Draw to Art, a new experiment that uses machine learning to match your doodles to drawings, paintings, and sculptures from museums around the world. With Draw to Art, a doodle of a house could help you discover Houses in Overs by Vincent van Gogh. A doodle of a horse could help you discover paintings of horses. And adding a stick man could help you discover this statue from Benin. We created a series of interactive easels with digital canvases, so people could try draw to art in galleries and cultural centers around the world, installing the first ones in the Google Cultural Institute space in Paris. So how did we make it work? Using machine learning, we trained a deep neural network to recognize visual features in doodles, like shapes, lines, and perspectives. We also trained it to recognize the same features in paintings, sketches, and sculptures from the collection. So draw to art can associate doodles to similar works of art. The best matches are then presented to the user, who can help teach the neural network by rating the matches to help improve the results for everyone. With Draw to Art, it's now possible to use creativity to discover great works of art from around the world in a whole new way. Halfway? There you go. Awesome. So, first one was the fossils, so history, second one, arts. And you hinted actually at the third project, you said the village, and this is my, actually my favorite of, of what is, <laughs> yeah. not only because it happens to be in Greece, but also because it's today. It's also using, not only looking at the past and surfacing it to today, is actually, yeah. so do you want to tell us a little bit uh, about this? One? I don't know if many people have been to the Yortes in Roca, in, uh, just outside of Have Kanya. you been? Anyone? Hopefully the people from Crete have been there. Okay, we have a couple. Um, so we were working with, with uh, the individuals out there and, and an individual, Panagiotis, who's now gone on to become uh, the mayor of Kanya, which is awesome. He's a fantastic guy. And um, every year they put on these yortes. Uh, and they're incredible. They're incredible. They open up the village and they turn them into 
Uh, I can't even begin to explain. Uh, they turn it into uh, a musical, a theater. Um, uh, every home, there's spoken word, there's, there's poetry, there's dance, everything like that. Um, and it's, it's just an incredible moment because it brings life back to the village. Um, and it all culminates at the end of the week uh, with a uh, orchestra literally playing on the mountainside under the full moon at the end of August. I want to get this right. Um, and it's so emotional. It's so emotional for the people who are there, uh, the people who discover these things, and the people who come back. And we made a film about the role that culture could play in reconnecting us to where we come from. I go, I spend a lot of time in Svakia, I spend a lot of time in Franco Castello. Uh, I am fascinated by the history. I talk about uh, how, how strong we were uh, in, uh, in our resistance in World War II to my children. Uh, and I, I feel, even though I, didn't, I wasn't born, they're very connected. And it's such an important thing as we're trying to define and, and really come to grips with our identity and who we are and what it means to be Greek today. So this Yortes is an incredible experience and these Yortes are an incre incredible experience. Um, and we came up with this film that, that sort of told the story of what could happen if a village, but I, I think it should be villages. I think yeah. this should be happening with everything that is unique to all the different villages all over this great country. Um, and what could happen when you introduce technology, because it was, I think Roca has a fiber line or access to it, uh, when you introduce technology and how you fill villages with both young people, but more importantly with life again. Go for it. That was my favorite. I love this. I, I didn't make him say that line, by the way. I didn't. <laughs> but do you see what I mean? Then in there, it's not a massive thing. And I, I think that's one place. And I think 
especially around the celebrations of our 200 year Elefteria, all that sort of stuff, every village, every voice do these sorts of things. So I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great moment. Um, and maybe to the last one, because we again went from the past to today. And let's, I think I mentioned actually in the, in the start when I, uh, in my presentation, the future as well. What is, what is Greece today? And this no. oh, disappeared when, when I was looking at it, never mind. So yeah, and you, you have thoughts this, about that. This is yeah, just, I'm not an expert in this yeah. area, so I don't want to offend anyone, but I think, uh, as I said, we have um, irrefutably, you know, in terms of our pristine coastline, our weather, 320 days of sunshine, etc., we have infrastructurally, I'll call it, an incredible place, and we should continue to make sure it stays incredible. Okay? We cannot allow cigarettes on beaches and all these sorts of things. It has to remain pristine. We have to do this, okay? But outside of that, I think um, we spend a lot of time talking about it, and, and I'm looking at it from a brand perspective, from a repositioning perspective. We talk a lot about what we did, and we should acknowledge it and we should celebrate it. We've done a lot with the contributions to, to uh, art, in science, in history, Everything, language, everything, okay? But I believe it's happening right now and it remains largely unacknowledged because we're still in survival, survival mode. We're still just trying, most people, I shouldn't even say we, most people are trying to get ahead. They're trying to make ends meet on, on very little. And I think this stuff is happening around us. And I literally just went through and I scoured whatever I could find to just put a bunch of stuff on a slide. And I put, you know, everything from Racomelo. Look at Racomelo. That doesn't look anything like the one that I drink from the two-liter uh, Seven Up bottle in uh, <laughs> Svaikia. Uh, but um, uh, our, our filmmakers, our fashion designers, our food. Uh, you know, I love a Choriatiki that doesn't look anything like anything like that. And I think this stuff is happening. Our designers, our street artists, that is art. That's not graffiti, that's street art. Where I was living in London in Shoreditch, there were buses pulling up around Brick Lane, dropping tourists off to go look at all the street art, and they were paying to look at street art. That okay? could happen in Exarchia. It could really? happen in it, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think that, that is all, and I, I'm not, I can't imagine you're not thinking this, but there is so much happening across all aspects of culture right now, and how do we build? Never, I mean, never, our bread and butter is what got us here, and we must continue, as I said, to protect it, okay? And to grow it and to innovate it, but how do we also shine a light across all these incredible things happening that will make Greece this destination beyond just vacationing. Things that will make them feel like a local. Things that will make them connect through cinema. All these sorts of things. And it's happening and we have to just tell the story. And to, to sort of tie it all up, I think that's... I don't like talking about rebranding and all that about Greece because you rebrand products. You don't rebrand people. You tell the story and you help create a narrative for the people. And that's what I think we should be doing, and we could be doing even more of. Thank you. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Best words to end up. Thank you, Steve. Guys, <laughs> Dibranaki. Nice.